Okay, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. My name is Anna Meadows and I'm an outreach coordinator with the Springfield Community Gardens. We're a nonprofit based in Springfield, Missouri, whose vision is a community where everyone has access to healthy local food. And we do that through our network of 18 gardens, community gardens around town, and also three farm incubator sites, as well as uh, educational opportunities like this one uh, to, to connect with the community. And this workshop on tomato production in high tunnels is a part of a larger workshop series on regenerative agriculture topics and is sponsored by the USDA NIFA uh, 2501 grant program. So that's the United States Department of Agriculture's National Institute of Food and Agriculture uh, 2501 grant program. And our speaker tonight is Patrick Byers. He's a horticulture field specialist with the University of Missouri Extension. And I will let him introduce himself further in just a moment, uh, but just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. If you have any questions throughout the night, we would love to hear them. Please ask as you go. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen that you can put your questions into, and I will be watching that throughout, throughout the presentation and relaying those to Patrick as we go. So feel, feel, to, feel free to put your questions down there as you have them. There's also a chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Please only use this for comments uh, as that helps me keep track of questions versus comments throughout the night. Also, once you leave this workshop, a screen will pop up with a link to a post-workshop survey on it. The survey is used in our reporting to the USDA and also <coughs> helps provide meaningful workshops to all of you in the future. So we'd appreciate it if you could take a few moments at the end of this workshop to fill out that, that questionnaire. If you have to leave early or you'd like to refer to this workshop later on, it will be available on SCG's Agriculture Workshop Playlist on our YouTube channel by the end of this week. I'll be putting that link as well as links to our website and social media and tonight's exit survey in the chat in just a moment. So I think that's all from me, Patrick. Thank you so much for being here tonight and welcome to everybody. Thanks, Anna. Well, it is a pleasure to be with you here this evening. As Anna mentioned, I am a horticulture field specialist with University of Missouri Extension, and I'm based in Webster County, and I serve a number of counties in Southwest Missouri. And our subject for tonight is high tunnel tomato production. And, you know, I, I've taken uh, sort of the commercial tomato production approach for the presentation, but there'll be a lot of information tonight. In fact, all the information will be helpful for home gardeners as well. And again, as Anna mentioned, please feel free at any point to enter a question into the Q&A box and we will tackle it as it comes in. We'll also have some time at the end of the presentation to, to address questions as well. But uh, with, with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, Anna, can we see the uh, presentation? We can see it. Okay, let me hide the meeting controls here. Okay, well, um, a bit about my background. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm a horticulture field specialist. I've been working with uh, uh, fruit and vegetable farmers since, uh, gosh, since 1989. And uh, it's been my pleasure to work with a number of successful tomato farmers across Missouri. And uh, one, one thing about growing tomatoes is that you could spend an entire career focused on just a single crop of uh, tomatoes because it's, it's such an interesting crop. There's so many nuances to successfully producing and marketing tomatoes. And for our presentation tonight, we'll see the outline here in a moment, but we're taking a little bit of a broad brush approach to, to tomato production. And please, there may be some topics that need further discussion. Give us a, a, a note in the question and answer. Uh, the Q&A box, and we will definitely tackle any additional information that, that you'd like to cover. Uh, as Anna mentioned, this is a partnership. Uh, Springfield Community Gardens is the, uh, the uh, lead partner in our workshop series. And again, as Anna mentioned, uh, the vision of Springfield Community Gardens is a community where everyone has access to healthy local food. And please check out the uh, programs that are available through Springfield Community Gardens. And then our other partner, of course, is the uh, USDA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And for more information on uh, USDA services that are available to farmers of all scale, uh, visit your local farm services agency. There's one in every county in Missouri. And go to the farmers.gov website to learn more about the, the broad range of uh, programs that are available through USDA. Uh, I'll mention in particular the NRCS, or Natural Resources Conservation Service, and the Risk Management Agency 
Uh, these two uh, branches of the USDA have programs that are of interest in particular to small scale diversified specialty crop farmers. Well, here's what we're going to cover tonight. I'll have some introductory material first, and then we'll get into the uh, meat of the presentation. We'll talk about high tunnels and tomatoes and, and uh, how we might set up a high tunnel for successful tomato production. We'll talk about tomato cultivars and types. We'll talk about preparing the tunnel for a tomato crop. Talk about starting seeds and transplants. And then we'll focus in uh, a, a good part of our time tonight on growing tomatoes and uh, looking at the growing environment and high tunnel tomato culture. And then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll end up with some thoughts on pest management and tomato harvest and, and uh, uh, that sort of thing. And again, I'll, I'll put a plea in. If you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A box. So a, a good question. Why would you consider growing tomatoes in a high tunnel? Well, a high tunnel is valuable real estate on a farm. You've gone to the effort to construct a structure. You've covered that structure. You've provided an irrigation system and other management tools within the structure. Why would you devote that space to tomatoes? Well, for good reason. It's a profitable crop. And in fact, studies and uh, farmers' experiences have demonstrated that tomatoes are among the most profitable of the uh, vegetable crops, and especially when grown in a high tunnel. Uh, in a high tunnel environment, tomatoes will have higher yields than the same cultivar in an open field setting. There'll be an improvement in fruit quality, there'll be fewer culls, and there'll be a reduction in pesticide applications. Now, as we'll see here a little bit later on tonight, the uh, high tunnel environment is not pest free but the spectrum of pests shifts in the high tunnel. And in general, fewer pesticide applications are needed to manage problems such as insects and diseases. This is a, a, a nice uh, slide. Well, th this slide it very nicely illustrates the benefits of growing in, in high tunnels. This was a picture taken at a farm here in Southwest Missouri and was taken during a rainy year. And if you look at this setup, this is a, a uh, a caterpillar tunnel, a three season tunnel. You'll notice that once we move into the tunnel, the tomato plants look great. There's a good crop coming off. There'll be lots of tomatoes to harvest. But you look at the tomatoes that are not protected by the high tunnel that are growing in the outside environment, and they quite frankly are a mess. The plants are dying. There's gonna be very little harvest off of those plants. It's like night and day when you compare the tunnel environment to growing in the open, open field, especially in an environment such as we have in Missouri. So again, there are compelling reasons why a farmer might consider growing tomatoes in the high tunnel. Now, it's easy to say grow tomatoes in the high tunnel, but there are lots of things to think about to be successful at growing tomatoes in high tunnels. And one thing, one key part of the equation, of course, is the structure, the high tunnel. And it's very important, uh, particularly if it, a, a farmer is establishing a high tunnel for a tomato crop production to think about the characteristics of that tunnel. If you're a farmer who already has a tunnel at their disposal, take a look at what you have. And this will give you a clear picture of whether or not that tunnel is suitable for tomatoes and particularly the, the types of tomatoes you might grow and the, uh, the uh, cultural practices, particularly the trellising that you might use with that tomato crop. So the first thing to think about, particularly if you're going to grow a tomato crop, we are going to suspend trellises from the structure of the tunnel is to think about structural bracing. You need a strong structure to support the weight of a crop of tomatoes. As we'll see a little bit later on tonight, these are big plants. They're heavy plants when they're, when they're producing a crop, and it's very important to have a well-braced structure. Four season versus three season. In general, four season tunnels are beefier. They are made of stronger components because they have to stand up to, to uh, the, uh, the environment year round in Missouri, including the winter when we have snow and ice. And those tunnels typically are, are again, stronger tunnels frequently with bracing. Those work very well for uh, 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 tomato crops where you're tying the trellising or hanging the trellising from the structure of the tunnel. Three season tunnels, on the other hand, typically are lighter weight structures, and they're more suitable for growing tomato crops where you're not suspending the trellises from the uh, framework of the tunnel. Gothic or sidewall versus uh, Kwanzaa styles, typically the uh, Gothic type is a better type of, of tunnel in which to grow tomatoes. Uh, the Gothic types typically have sidewalls and they allow uh, production closer to the edges, whereas Kwanzaa styles, uh, as you approach the edge of the tunnel, very quickly you lose head space and it, you have to start the uh, tomato crop some distance away from the edges. 
Now, granted, you could use those edge areas for other crops, but in general, if we're thinking about a tomato crop, you want to utilize as much of the space as the tunnel as possible. And certainly with a Gothic or, or a sidewall type, this is, is the case. <clears throat> a double layer of plastic, particularly if you're interested in starting a tomato crop early in the season or carrying that tomato crop later in the fall. A double layer of plastic gives you an insulative layer of air between the two layers of plastic, which will help hold heat in the tunnel if you choose to use supplemental heat. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on as well. Buried insulation around the high tunnel. Again, if your goal is to start a crop early or carry it late, where you might be supplying heat in the tunnel, it's helpful to have buried insulation. That way, as you warm the soil within the tunnel, you'll keep that soil mass warmer than if it's in direct contact with the mass of the soil outside of the tunnel. And then supplemental heat. You think about how you might heat that tunnel. Frequently, uh, non-permanent heating systems are used. These would be things such as uh, propane-fired heaters or wood-burning stoves or other types of systems where you can move them into and out of the tunnel in response to cold temperatures, particularly early in the season. But again, this is something to consider when you think about customizing the high tunnel for tomatoes. Let's take a look at some high tunnels. Here we see an example of a three-season tunnel. Again, not a real strong structure. If we look at that, basically all we have are bows that are supporting the plastic. And if we look at the crop within the tunnel, we're not hanging that crop from the structure of the tunnel. This is what is called determinate tomatoes. These are lower growing tomatoes and we're staking them and tying them up with a system that does not uh, depend upon the structure of the tunnel for support. Now we're into a four season tunnel. Again, if we look at the structure, we can see it's stronger. There's internal bracing. But in this case, again, we're looking at a determinant tomato crop. We're not suspending that crop from the structure of the tunnel. Uh, notice uh, in this picture too, and we'll talk more about this a little bit later on, how the ground is managed around the tomato crops. Now here is an example of a uh, indeterminate crop. This is early on in the production cycle. The plants are still small. But notice how the twine trellises are tied to the structure of the high tunnel. Uh, in this case, there are pieces of conduit that run down the length of the tunnel, and they are supported by the bows, by the structure of the tunnel. And then the string trellises are tied to those conduit strips. Okay, you've heard me talk about the terms determinate and indeterminate, and so now is a good time to define what those terms mean. Now, a determinate tomato is a lower growing plant. It produces a flower cluster at the terminal growth point at some, some time during the growth cycle of the tomato. And that basically stops growth at that height. Typically with a determinate tomato, this height will be somewhere between four to five feet. Now, once the growth stops and, and uh, you have fruit set, that's basically as much fruit as you're going to set. But these are very productive cultivars they produce a lot of fruit that matures over a shorter period of time. Four to six weeks is the typical harvest season for a determinate tomato crop. Now, why would you consider a determinate crop? Well, particularly if you're looking at rotations or if you're looking at different times of the season in which to, uh, to harvest and market tomatoes, perhaps an early crop, perhaps a late summer and fall crop. Well, we can, we can easily achieve this with determinate cultivars. And then we can rotate amongst other crops in between, be, uh, between these two tomato crops or before or after the tomato crops. So it gives us more flexibility. Most determinate tomatoes are hybrid slicing cultivars. We also have a group of tomatoes that are called indeterminate tomatoes. And indeterminate tomatoes never set a terminal flower cluster. The plant continues to grow and it grows and it grows. And in fact, in warm climates, uh, indeterminate tomatoes are, are are nearly perennial in nature. In fact, they can grow from one season to another. In the uh, high tunnel environment in Missouri, typically indeterminate tomatoes are looked at as a long season crop, oftentimes uh, as long as uh, uh, 10 to 12 weeks or even longer. And uh, these systems, these types of tomatoes require a trellising system that is more intense than determinate types. And again, to, to achieve the, the, uh, the expected yield from an indeterminate type tomato, it requires much more in the way of management as well. So again, longer season, a, a greater overall yield, but a more intensive management system with indeterminate type tomatoes. There are many different types of tomatoes that are indeterminates. 
Most cherry tomato cultivars are indeterminates. There are hybrid slicing cultivars that are indeterminates, beefsteak types, and most heirloom tomatoes are indeterminate tomatoes. Uh, we have a, a, a group of tomatoes that are called greenhouse tomatoes that are frequently grown in controlled environments inside greenhouses. And most greenhouse tomatoes can also be grown in high tunnels. And again, these are all for the most part indeterminate types of tomatoes. So let's uh, take a quick look at what they might look like. And if we look at these tomatoes in this tunnel, uh, the row of tomatoes on the right, these are indeterminate tomatoes. Again, notice the height on these plants. And uh, if you look down at the base of the plants, you'll notice that these have already been leaned. And we'll talk more about leaning here in a moment. But these are tall plants already. An indeterminate tomato over the course of a growing season in Missouri can easily reach a length of 20 to 30 feet. Now, on the... Uh, the other side, on the left side, we see a row of determinate tomatoes. And these determinate tomatoes have reached their full height, as you see in the picture. It's a little harder to see the trellising on, on these, but it's not a system where they're suspended from overhead. They're, they're held up by what's called stake and weave. And we'll see more about that here in a moment as well. But again, this is an interesting shot to help contrast indeterminate types on the right with determinate types on the left. Do we have any questions at, at this point, Anna? We do not, not yet. Okay, very good. This is, a, again, these are important concepts to understand, especially if you're new to, uh, to tomato production. Now, as we uh, uh, decide on what type of tomato to, to grow, certainly we look at the uh, type of tunnel we have. If we have a strong tunnel, if it's a four season tunnel, where we can, uh, again, conceivably start tomatoes early and carry them for a long season, then we might consider indeterminate tomatoes. If we have a four season or a three season uh, tunnel, particularly if we have a three season tunnel, then we might consider determinate types. If we want earliness, determinate type tomatoes are the better type to choose. If we wanna rotate the tunnel into another crop, then again, determinate types are the type of tomato to choose. Now, looking at cultivars, there are lots of cultivars that have been successfully grown in high tunnels. And uh, looking at this list, this list was developed uh, over the course of several years of surveying tomato farmers in Missouri to get a feel for what they would consider to be important cultivars in a high tunnel. And if we look at this list, we see a number of indeterminate types. They include Big Dina, Goliath, Big Beef, uh, Geronimo, and uh, Torero. We see a number of uh, uh, determinate types, again, almost any determinate type tomato can be successfully grown in a high tunnel. Uh, these were the ones, again, that were reported as leaders by, by growers, but almost any type of determinate tomato can be grown in a high tunnel. Now, what about grafted tomatoes? What about planting tomatoes that are grafted onto an improved root system? Well, in the tunnel environment, we oftentimes run into issues with soil-borne diseases, particularly if we've used that tunnel for uh, several cycles of, uh, of tomato production. These might be soil-borne diseases such as Verticillium or Fusarium, or perhaps we're in a situation where we're developing uh, higher pH soils or soils that have higher uh, salt contents. Well, in these cases, oftentimes we can address these issues by grafting the uh, cultivar, the uh, desired cultivar, onto a root system, onto a root stock that can endure these adverse soil conditions. And so there are benefits to, to planting grafted tomatoes in high tunnels. We oftentimes see a yield increase. Oftentimes the uh, root stock will impart bigger and we may see a yield increase. And in some cases we can actually take a plant and divide it into two liters and grow um, significantly more plant with the, the single original plant. And again, we see an increased yield per plant by using a, a two liter approach to, to growing these plants. But there are some compelling advantages to growing grafted tomatoes. What are the disadvantages? Well, extra cost. If you purchase a grafted seedling, it'll be nearly twice the cost of an ungrafted seedling. If you decide to graft your own, then you have the logistics of, of performing the grafting process. And for more information on grafting tomatoes, please reach out. Uh, we've, we have programs to help train farmers on uh, tomato grafting. And I'd love to share more information on the advantages and, and yes, the challenges of using grafted tomatoes in a high tunnel. Okay, now let's talk about preparing the tunnel for a, a tomato crop. <clears throat> now, the first step is to submit a soil test. 
uh, a soil test should be used with each rotation of tomatoes in a tunnel. And the soil test report will come back with information on, first of all, adjusting soil nutrients as needed, and also come back with recommendations on the amount of nutrients needed, particularly uh, nitrogen, to produce the, uh, the, the crop. Uh, in most cases, uh, with a new tunnel, uh, it's, it's uh, very helpful to some supplement soil organic matter with an application of compost. How much compost? Well, easily one to two inches over the surface of the high tunnel would be beneficial. Now, if you're putting a tomato crop into a tomato into a tunnel that previously had a tomato crop, then there are some considerations. First of all, clear away all tomato debris. Tomato debris can be a harboring point for uh, diseases that can then become a problem with the newly established crop. If you have a history of bacterial diseases in the tunnel, then sanitation becomes critically important. Certainly clearing away all debris, but also cleaning and sanitizing the tunnel structure, the stakes, trellising supplies, anything that might come into contact with the, uh, the new crop. Uh, conduct a soil test with a, uh, uh, as I mentioned, between or, or in advance of each tomato rotation. And if it's a tunnel where you've had tomatoes before, ask for a salts test. This will give you a clear picture as to whether or not uh, you're seeing salt buildup in the soil. And typically after four or five rotations of tomatoes, unless you've done something specifically to reduce salt content in the soil, you will be seeing um, a rise in salt content. And high salt levels can make the soil unsuitable for tomato production. Uh, cover crops. If you have the time to insert a cover crop between tomato rotations, this can be very helpful. If you are in a situation where you're getting close to the time to replace the plastic, uh, remove the plastic and allow rainfall to fall into the tunnel before you plant the, uh, the tomato crop. This will allow for the leaching or the flushing away of salts in the soil. And then again, rotations are helpful if there's any way that you can grow a non-tomato crop in that tunnel before replanting with a, a, a following tomato crop, this will be helpful. Again, the idea of tomato crop after tomato crop after tomato crop can present production challenges for farmers. Okay, any questions at this point, Anna? No, no questions yet. Okay, very good. All right, now let's talk about getting started with the crop itself. And um, many farmers will start their own transplants from seeds. It's also possible, of course, to purchase transplants from nurseries. And um, we have a number of nurseries in Missouri that specialize in growing tomato transplants. And this can be a good way to start a crop. But from the standpoint of managing uh, uh, planting times, oftentimes it's in the farmer's interest to grow their own, own transplants. Now, generally transplants need to be grown in a very, very protected, controlled environment where you can take, uh, where you can easily control temperature, light, and humidity. Uh, tomato seeds are expensive and those seedlings require good care when they're young so that they can vigorously grow to a size where they're ready to transplant into the tunnel environment. So it's, it's, it's very helpful to, to set aside a specific area for germinating seed and growing transplants. Uh, all supplies and media should be sterile and new, or if they're not new, they should be thoroughly cleaned and sanitized. Very easy to transmit diseases to, to uh, uh, tomato transplants. If you're, you're planting containers, if your media, if anything that comes into contact with the uh, tomato transplants is not clean and sterile. Typically, uh, 50 to 72 cell trays are what are recommended. 72 cell trays, quite frankly, are fairly small and uh, tomato transplants won't be able to spend much time in those trays. Uh, somewhere closer to a 50 cell tray gives you more flexibility from the standpoint of growing the transplant to a size where it can then be transplanted into the high tunnel. Now, ideal germination conditions, uh, 75 degrees F is uh, optimum for germination. Once the plants are up and growing, then uh, slightly cooler temperatures, 60 to 70 degrees, are great for seedling growth. You need uh, quite a bit of light to support the growth of seedlings, 1,000 to 1,500 foot candles, and you need adequate ventilation. Yes, you do need uh, some humidity, but you need to have good air movement and good ventilation to prevent uh, disease issues that can become a problem on these uh, growing seedlings. Typically, we expect five to seven weeks from planting the seeds to growing the seedlings to a size where they're ready to be transplanted into the high tunnel. If temperatures are cooler than the optimum temperatures, it will be a longer period of time from seedling to transplant. Here's an example of an area that has been set aside for growing tomato transplants. And again, notice that 
uh, it's an area that's separate from the main part of the, uh, the high tunnel or the greenhouse. We're able to control light, <clears throat> the amount of light with these fixtures, which can be raised and lowered. And we have a plastic sheet in place to help provide high humidity till the seeds are up and growing. This plastic sheet can then be removed and again, to provide for good ventilation. Okay, now from the standpoint of uh, the growing environment, you know, we talked uh, a, a bit about how to set up a tunnel for growing tomatoes. Now let's talk a little bit about things we might do specifically in starting an early crop. Now, supplemental heat. If you choose to use uh, a heating system that you move into and out of the high tunnel, make sure that it's adequately vented. Uh, any exhaust fumes from burning wood, from burning propane or natural gas can be very damaging to tomatoes. Uh, these, these fumes contain uh, substances like ethylene, which can cause uh, distortion and, and even death of tomato seedlings. So make sure that you have adequate ventilation. Uh, make sure that these heaters are adequately vented. Uh, make sure that the vents are tight. Make sure that they draw well so that you don't get the movement of exhaust fumes back into the tunnel. And then if you are going to, to routinely start tomato crops early, and we're seeing farmers now planting uh, tomato crops in February in high tunnels, then you might want to think about heat distribution. Yes, you can have a heat source, but it's important to move that heat source throughout the high tunnel. And this can be done with plastic tubes uh, and forced air or with ventilating fans or, or, or other ways to move this heat. There are also uh, systems that can be developed where you have under, under uh, a bed movement of hot water or, or you know, other ways to distribute heat. But it is important that you have a system in place where you can move heat throughout the high tunnel. And then row covers can be helpful too. Uh, you know, we have the protection of the overall high tunnel, yes, but we can also place row covers over the tomato plants themselves and sometimes even over individual rows of tomatoes. Patrick, so you have a couple of questions? Yes, let's tackle those questions. Okay, the first one is, what is the best way to sanitize trays and tunnel equipment? So a good way to sanitize trays is first of all to clean them to make, make sure there's no uh, debris, no, no soil or media debris, no plant debris on them. Uh, and uh, this can be done with, with a, a uh, scrub brush and a detergent solution, then rinse them well, and then disinfect them with a 10% uh, sodium hypochlorite or, or bleach solution. There are other sanitizers that can be used as well. You know, things such as Sanidate and uh, Tsunami can be used to effectively sanitize uh, things such as uh, trays and cell packs if you choose to reuse cell packs. Now, disinfecting tunnel structures, wood stakes, those sorts of things, those, that is typically done, first of all, again, by, by removing debris from the structure or the stakes, and then by spraying them or soaking, in the, in the case of stakes, in a 10% sodium hypochlorite solution, and then taking them out, allowing them to air dry, and if possible, storing them in the sun. Um, I mean, from the standpoint of stakes. Now, obviously, it's it's not helpful to store stakes outside, you know, exposed to the weather. You, you end up getting deterioration of your stakes. But if you can store them in an environment such as in an unused high tunnel in the sun, the ultraviolet rays in the sun will help keep the uh, stakes clean and, and uh, ready to be used in the following season. Okay, and then we have another question that says, how do you feel about a geothermal system in a four season high tunnel for controlling temperature throughout the year? I think a geothermal is an excellent way to take advantage of the mass of the soil and the uh, warmth that is retained in the mass of the soil. Uh, geothermal systems are expensive to put in, but once they're installed, they're very low maintenance and they can provide a significant amount of warming in the high tunnel environment early in the season. Uh, it's my advice to work with a, a specialist, someone who has experience with, with geothermal setups for high tunnels. But yes, uh, particularly in the environment in Southwest Missouri, geothermal hertz holds good potential. Do we have additional questions? No, uh, sorry, I was just muted. Uh, those are all the questions for now, thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, let's take a look at this slide here. This slide is interesting, it's a high tunnel. Uh, the farmer has installed a more or less permanent heating system in this tunnel. And uh, it's a little hard to see, but suspended uh, up above head height towards the back of the tunnel is a, a propane uh, furnace. And then uh, the furnace kicks on and you can see the insulated tubes. These are, are plastic tubes with insulation around them. 
that go under the tomato plants. And again, a little hard to see, but uh, each of these beds has two rows of plants and the, the, uh, the uh, heating tube goes down between the rows of plants on top of each bed. And then the, uh, the uh, uh, plastic tube has holes in it. And so as the warm air is forced down the row by a fan, the warm air then comes out through the holes in the tube and keeps the plants warm. You also see the, uh, the uh, uh, structure there made out of PVC pipes. The uh, farmer will drape row covers over the tops of the rows to help hold that warm air in close to the plants on cold frosty nights. So again, a somewhat elaborate system, but a very, very uh, effective system in keeping an early established tomato crop from freezing on, on cold nights. Okay, now as far as planting design for, for greenhouse tomatoes, typically you want to allow about five square feet per plant. And what this means is that you need 36 to 48 inches between rows, and you need 18 to 24 inches between plants. Typically the closer spacing would be used for determinate tomatoes and the wider spacing for indeterminate tomatoes. Raised beds are commonly used in the high tunnel. These will be eight to 10 inches high and the crown or the width of the bed will be 30 to 36 inches wide. Okay, this gives you plenty of growing space for, for uh, uh, two rows of tomatoes. Drip irrigation is commonly used, eight to 10 mil tape, and the uh, drippers should be spaced four to 12 inches apart. A common spacing is eight inches apart. Uh, the drip system will, will typically operate at somewhere between eight to 15 pounds per square inch. So make sure that you have a system that can deliver this much uh, pressure over the entire part of the, uh, the tunnel that you want to irrigate. If water is in short supply, you can actually zone a high tunnel. But in most cases, the high tunnel is, is set up to, to be watered all at one time. Now, floor management, remember I, should, I mentioned that in that earlier picture, uh, you wanna think carefully about uh, weed management in high tunnels, and you wanna think about managing foot traffic as well. And the uh, bed itself is covered with, typically with a plastic mulch, or, or some other type of mulch. And then weed barrier fabric, yes, that can be used over the, the bed as well, but frequently weed barrier fabric is also used between the rows. Now, if you leave the soil bare, recognize that you, you will have to manage weeds in that area. And there's always the, uh, the uh, situation where you can, can track things into and out of the tunnel that might lead to disease issues with bare soil. Yes, that can happen with grow covers or uh, something like weed barrier fabric as well, but typically it's less of an issue. So here again, here's an example of a high tunnel. This is a determinate tomato crop. We can see the raised beds. We can see the uh, plastic mulch that's placed over the beds. In this case, the farmer is planting one row of tomatoes per bed, uh, a little bit wider bed and uh, two rows can be accommodated. Um, the area between the rows in this particular high tunnel is maintained in bare soil. Now, as far as transplanting the uh, tomatoes into the high tunnel, again, five to seven weeks after seeding, uh, don't wait too long. You don't want the tomato seedlings to become uh, uh, bound in the, uh, the uh, cell packs if you're growing them in cell packs. If you're growing them in soil blocks, uh, root binding is less of an issue, but you, you, you don't want a, a very tight mass of roots in the, uh, the uh, uh, soil that you're, or the, the media that's around the tomato uh, root system when you plant out. If you do have a situation where the seedlings have been a bit long in the containers, it is possible to tease those root systems apart or even to physically break them apart so that you uh, encourage movement of the roots outside of the root ball. Now, again, as I mentioned, we've seen, we're seeing an increasing trend to plant early. Now, the reason we're planting early, of course, is to encourage an early harvest. And the uh, price received for tomatoes is much higher early in the season. And so those early crops are quite valuable and uh, there is, uh, uh, you can justify some of the inputs that go into producing an early crop of tomatoes, particularly the cost of heating. Now, again, when, when are we planting? We can plant as early as mid-February. The earlier you plant, of course, the more inputs you'll need as far as heat, because it's going to get cold between February and, oh, the end of April when, uh, when uh, you know, our last frosts are, are typically uh, uh, expected here in, in, in Missouri. So, if you're planning early, recognize the risk and take measures that, that, to, to manage this risk. As I mentioned before, it might be something such as a double layer of plastic on the high tunnel. 
insulation in the soil around the tunnel, and in particular, a supplemental heating system. Okay, as far as temperature management, uh, the ideal temperature for growing a tomato crop is 80 to 85 degrees during the day, and night temperatures above 62 degrees, but, but below 72 degrees. In other words, you want a fairly warm environment, but not too warm during the day, and then you want it to cool off about 10 degrees at night. Now, what happens if it gets too hot? Well, if it gets too hot, the uh, tomato plants will drop losses and you'll lose crop. What happens if it gets too cold? Well, if it gets too cold, tomatoes stop growing. Okay, and if it gets extremely cold, they can actually die. So temperatures uh, you know, below freezing obviously will kill tomatoes, but even temperatures below 50 degrees will severely uh, stunt or slow down the growth of tomatoes. So again, it's important to maintain these ideal temperatures. Now, if it's too cold, supplemental heating is necessary. Uh, during cool weather, it may be necessary to raise and lower side curtains. In a high tunnel, it can very quickly warm to temperatures above the optimum temperatures for tomatoes, even early in the season on a sunny day. So it's necessary to, to uh, raise and lower side curtains even during cooler parts of the year, even during March, April, and perhaps even as early as February during warm sunny days. Um, exhaust fans can be very helpful, particularly as we move into the warmer part of the growing season. It's very important to, to move that warm air out of the high tunnel. And yes, we do get a benefit from raising or, or from, uh, from opening the side curtains and opening end vents, but active ventilation can be helpful as well. So exhaust fans to move air around within the tunnel and perhaps exhaust fans on the end walls to again, move warm air out of the, the uh, tunnel. It's also a common practice to place shade cloth over high tunnels, uh, uh, the, uh, over a tomato crop, and 40 to 50% shade is what is typically used. And the shade cloth, again, is an effort to help manage high temperatures in the high tunnel. Okay, any questions at this point, Anna? No questions right now. Okay, now let's talk about training. And this is, uh, it's, it's an interesting subject. And quite frankly, it's, it's uh, difficult to teach it from slides. It's much better to actually go out and visit a farm and spend a little time actually training tomatoes. And uh, again, there, there's, there's no substitute for hands-on. So hopefully at some point we'll be able to get back together in person and we'll be doing these workshops on site where we can actually do some of these practices. But I'll do my best to describe training techniques for tomatoes. And if there are any questions, please let me know. Now with determinate tomatoes, again, recognizing that these are going to be probably about four to five feet in height and that's it, they are typically trained using what's called the Florida stake and weave system. So with uh, these types of tomatoes, we initially start out with, with, with a single stemmed plant and we remove the, the very lowest suckers on the plant, uh, typically up to the point where the uh, first flower cluster uh, develops and then we just let it grow, okay? Now, um, we place stakes uh, down the, uh, the row of tomatoes. Usually there's one stake between every two plants. And we have uh, a bracing system at the ends of the rows to help hold things up. And once we place the stakes, then we take twine, we tie it off at the end, and then we move our way down the row. And uh, as we come to a stake, then we wrap that twine around the stake. And then we continue moving down the same side of the row until we get to the end of the row. Again, wrapping the twine each time we come to a stake. Then we come down the other side of that same row. We're essentially sandwiching the tomato stems between two pieces of twine. And we come, again, we, we walk down the row, we wrap around each stake, and when we come down to the end, we tie off that twine. And so now we have the young tomato plants supported by two pieces of twine, one on either side of the stems. And we, re we repeat this process uh, as the tomato plants grow. And uh, as we get, oh, uh, uh, eight to 10 inches of growth on the stems, before they begin to lean back out into the row middle, we come back with another wrap of twine. And typically we'll have four to five wraps of twine by the time the tomatoes reach their mature height. Uh, again, uh, how, how frequently is this? So probably once every uh, 10 days or so uh, as the tomatoes are growing. And here we can see, uh, if we look at the right picture, we can see an example of a row of tomatoes that has three wraps of twine on. And again, notice how the twine is, is wrapped around each of the stakes. This is a wooden stake. And then if we look closely, we can see that there's a twine on either side of the tomato stems. 
If we do have a situation where stems start to lean before we get the next wrap of twine on, then we have to actually raise the stems up with the twine as we walk down the row. Now, this can be backbreaking work, and uh, it's uh, a good practice to, to come up with aids such as this farmer has on the, uh, the uh, left here. And what she does, if you notice that she's got a bale of twine in the pack on her back, the twine goes out and up through the top of that piece of PVC pipe that she has. And then she grips that piece of pipe and she places the base of the pipe at the, uh, the uh, end post, she ties it there, and then she can walk down the row now and using that piece of PVC pipe, she can wrap it around the uh, stake without having to bend over. And then she'll walk down the row and she'll repeat that process at each stake. Then she'll come down the other side of the row, again, wrapping it when she comes to the, uh, the pokes, the, uh, the stakes. Again, it's a very innovative, very creative way, I think, to uh, re uh, reduce some of the, uh, the uh, back bending that uh, uh, can be a problem in, in growing a tomato crop. Again, here we see a high tunnel that has a crop of determinate tomatoes that had been trained to the Florida stake and weave. Now, a little bit about printing determinate tomatoes on, on stake and weave. So again, we, we, uh, we uh, wait till we have the first fruit truss. This is the first cluster of blossoms that develops on the uh, tomato plant. And the first fruit set, once the initial uh, fruit, the largest fruit in that first group of fruit is the size of a nickel. Then we go down to the next leaf below it. We might leave that sucker, but then we go down below that and take everything out below. Okay, we take out all of the suckers and we, in some cases, also remove the fruit, the uh, flower, or not, sorry, not the flowers, the uh, leaves down there in, in that area. What we're trying to do is encourage air movement under the row. Okay. Now, it's important not to over prune determinate tomatoes. Again, you're, you're using this twine to hold the branches up. The fruit is very exposed. And if you remove suckers above the fruit, you can actually have problems with sun scald on the fruit. So you don't want to over prune determinate tomatoes. Again, you're focusing on the lower part of the stem. You're not doing much, if any, pruning above that first cluster of tomatoes. Okay, now indeterminate tomatoes. This is a, an entirely different approach. Again, remember that indeterminate tomatoes don't stop growing. They keep growing and they keep growing and they keep growing. And when we think about trellising, we have to come up with a system that takes advantage of this growth and accommodates this growth to the high tunnel environment. And typically this is done by training these tomatoes to a string or a twine that is attached overhead. Now, frequently it's attached to the structure of the high tunnel or can be attached to a cable or a wire that's attached to the structure of a high tunnel. In a few cases, I've seen farmers actually construct support systems, you know, overhead support systems made out of wood or something else within the high tunnel. But in most cases, we rely upon the structure of the high tunnel to support the trellises for indeterminate tomato cultivars. Generally, what we use is a string bobbin, and the string bobbin is wound with twine. And again, typically at least 30 feet, uh, frequently more, is, is uh, wound onto the string bobbin. The string bobbin is then hung from our overhead support. Now, in most cases, uh, indeterminate tomatoes are trained to one stem. There are systems that have been, been uh, developed where two stems are used, and especially with grafted plants where we have uh, lots of vigor, this may be a good way to, to do it. But in most cases, we're gonna train these tomatoes to a single stem. And then we tie or clip the bottom of the string to the base of the plant when it's small, when it has about six to eight leaves. And then as the plant grows, we clip it to the twine, okay? Now, um, again, it's, it's, it's you know, I'm, I'm describing it to you, but it, it may be hard to visualize. And I have some pictures here that, that uh, kind of show you how it works. But again, until you actually do this yourself, it's, it's, it, it doesn't really come home to, to, to all the nuances. But, uh, basically, as the tomato plant grows, you sucker it, and then you attach clips to the twine that then hold the plant to the twine. The, the clip has a tight connection to the twine and a loose connection to the stem. Typically, we attach these clips under a leaf, and you're going to be out there clipping and pruning these plants frequently, at least once per week. And if the plants are growing very rapidly, you may be out there more than once per week. And uh, some farmers, rather than using clips, twist the stems around 
the, uh, the, the or twist the string around the stem to hold it up. Again, if you're going to do this, it always has to be in the same direction. But in general, using clips is a more secure way to hold the plant up. Now, when the uh, plants reach the, the, uh, the, the terminal height, um, the desired height, typically this is about five feet from the ground, sometimes six feet, then you have to drop the plant. And dropping the plant, what you do is you, you uh, uh, unhook the bobbin, you unwind some twine, and you basically take the base of the plant and lay it on the ground, and then you bring the rest of the plant back up and reattach the bobbin to the overhead structure. And again, kind of hard to visualize perhaps in the way I'm describing it, but once you've seen it done, then you can understand why this system works and why it works well with indeterminate tomatoes, again, that keep growing and keep growing. So, so here's some pictures. Here's an example of a farmer who had a tunnel that didn't have a good support system. So the farmer built a support system out of, uh, out of uh, a lumber to support the weight of the uh, trellises. But this would be a more typical approach. You can see the wire there that's attached to the structure of the tunnel and you can see the bobbin. And the bobbin again has um, string tied to it. And uh, this is one style. There are other styles of, of uh, bobbins. So there's a style called the tomahawk, which is widely used. But as the, uh, the tomato plant grows, when it reaches the desired height, then the bobbin is unhooked from the wire. And then probably somewhere around two to three feet of twine is, is unwound from the bobbin. The plant is carefully moved down the row, you know, as far as laying the base of the plant along the ground. And then the bobbin is brought back up and reattached to the wire. So here we see the young plants and we're just starting off with the system. The, uh, the uh, twines have been clipped to or, or attached to the base of the plants. And again, as I mentioned, usually somewhere around six to eight leaves is where this is done. And if we look in that bucket in the center, we can actually see the clips that are going to be used to attach the tomato plants to the twine. Here's a close-up that's a little harder to see, but uh, if you notice that clip down there below the uh, leaf, uh, the, uh, if you look at the right side, you can see the tight connection to the twine and then uh, the uh, loose connection to the stem. The uh, tight connection to the twine keeps the clip from sliding on the twine. And then of course the loose connection keeps the, uh, the uh, clip from girdling or constricting the stem of the tomato. Here we can see a, a taller series of plants. And again, they've been clipped to the twine as they've grown. And if you look down at the base, you'll notice that the uh, suckers and the leaves have been removed from the very base of the plants. And these are plants that are just now getting, uh, have, have been leaned once. You'll notice that they're kind of growing at an angle. Well, that's what leaning is all about. Again, you unhook the uh, bobbin, you unwind some twine, and then you lay the plant down. Now, to, to make this work in a row of tomatoes, you always start at one end and wrap the end tomato around the end of the row, and then you work your way back down the row, laying the plants towards that first tomato that you wrapped around the end of the row. Here we can see some tomato plants that have been uh, uh, laid down probably twice. You'll notice that there's quite a bit of stem down there on the ground. Notice too that all of the leaves and the suckers on the lower part of the plant have been removed. You don't want foliage or shoots contacting the ground. This is an open invitation to disease issues. So with indeterminate types, you're always not only out there clipping the, or, or trellising, clipping the, the tomato plants, but you're also removing leaves and removing uh, suckers. And here we can see the farmer out there suckering the tomato. He's removing the suckers, leaving just one growing point. And then after he's done with that, he'll move his attention down to the base of the plant and remove leaves that would be on the ground when these plants are laid down. Now here's an example of some tomato plants that have been growing for a long period of time in the high tunnel. And these plants have been, been leaned probably three or four times. Again, notice that we have long bare stems that are down along near the soil surface. Now, uh, again, pruning goes hand in hand with trellising indeterminate cultivars. Again, when the first fruit tress has fruit the size of a nickel, it's time to go down, skipping the sucker branch and prune out everything below. Uh, indeterminate cultivars can be trained to two liters, but most of them are trained to one liter and uh, all the suckers will be removed. Now, as the uh, fruit trusses are harvested, keep taking those suckers out. 
if you end up with a lot of growth at the top where you have competing leaders, remove suckers at this point as well. And again, this is gonna be done frequently when the tomato plants are actively growing every three to four days, but certainly at least once a week. Okay, do we have any questions on training and pruning tomatoes? We do not, not right now. Okay, now let's talk about pollination. And, uh, you know, tomatoes are self-fertile and, and they can be easily self-pollinated. But the pollen has to be loosened from the, the uh, stamens and dusted on the stigma. And if you look at this tomato flower here in the picture, uh, the one that we can see the center part of the flower, the uh, part that projects out from the blossoms, those are actually the, uh, the uh, stamens of the tomato. And at the end of those stamens, there is a small opening called a pore. And the pollen comes out through that pore. And at the very center of these stamens, there is the pistil. That's the female part of the tomato. And that pollen has to move from those pores in the stamens to the pistil. It's a very, very short distance, but it requires movement of the flower for that to happen. Okay. Now, what can move a flower? Well, certainly air currents can move the flowers and help. Uh, the action of pollinating insects can do it as well. And so can human intervention. Hand pollination can, can help encourage fruit set as well but you have to have this movement of pollen from the stamens to the pistil. Now, if you're gonna do it by hand, it needs to be done daily and it should be done early in the day, uh, somewhere around 10 a.m. It can be done a little bit later up to 3 p.m., but don't do it too early in the day. Uh, bumblebees are very effective at pollinating um, uh, high tunnel tomatoes. And if you're gonna use bumblebees, you should place the hives when the first blossoms open Keep in mind that a hive is active for about six to 10 weeks. Now this is certainly plenty of time for a determinate crop of tomatoes, but for indeterminate tomatoes, it may require a second set of bumblebee hives to, to bring on the uh, fruit set for the remainder of the uh, production season. Now flowering to harvest, typically once the first flower opens, you're about 45 days from harvest. Now here's a, uh, again, a very innovative tomato farmer and he is performing pollination by using a leaf blower where he's removed the tube from the leaf blower. He walks up and down the, the uh, tomato rows with the leaf blower on a low setting. And just the action of the leaf blower uh, gives enough movement in the uh, flower clusters for that pollen to move from the stamens to the pistil. Again, very innovative, very creative. Here's an example of a bumblebee colony. And uh, again, if you had sharp eyes, you might've noticed on that earlier picture I showed you the, when we were talking about clips, you saw the bumblebee that was in the, uh, the tomato blossom, but bumblebees are very effective at moving pollen in tomato flowers. And so rather than honeybees, uh, bumblebees are used in the tunnel environment. There's also strong evidence that the tunnel environment confuses uh, honeybees and they're not as effective as, po uh, as a pollinator in that environment. Bumblebees are more effective. Now, once the uh, fruit has set, then our attention turns to developing good size on the fruit. And particularly with slicing tomatoes, it, it's helpful to thin the fruit. Now, typically a fruit cluster may set as many as seven fruit. And if you allow all of those fruit to develop, the resulting fruit at harvest will be smaller in size. So in general, farmers will thin clusters to three to four fruit. And again, looking at that cluster over there on, well, in fact, both cases you see one cluster with three fruit on the left and uh, a cluster with four fruit on the right. Now, typically it's not necessary to thin cherry tomatoes or other small fruited tomatoes. They uh, will, will develop their full size even when in large clusters. But in the case of slicers or heirlooms or beefsteak type tomatoes, it's helpful to thin the clusters to three to four fruit. And how frequently should you thin? Well, as the uh, clusters develop, uh, particularly as you get into uh, uh, the more active growth period for the tomato plants, this may be as often as once per week. Now, leaf removal. We talked about uh, pruning tomatoes by removing suckers, and I talked about leaf removal as well. But removing leaves is helpful because it improves air movement beneath the plant. Again, these are tomato plants that have uh, indeterminate tomato plants that have been, been lowered. Uh, this is a, 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 a nice slide to show you how the plants are wrapped around the end post of the uh, support system for the trellis. And again, you can see how they're wrapping around and now they're heading off down the other side of the row. 
with indeterminates, you're going to remove the leaves before leaning and lowering. And uh, you're always you're always focused again on the oldest leaves. As you lean and lower, the leaves would be in contact with the ground. So it's usually four to six leaves that are removed each time the plants are leaned and lowered. Okay, now let's turn our attention to fertility. And uh, with, with uh, high tunnel tomatoes, especially with indeterminate tomatoes, fertility management is critical to success with the crop. Now, before you transplant, uh, two to three months before you transplant, as I mentioned before, and I'll mention now, it's a good practice to collect a soil sample. And then when the soil test result comes back, uh, then uh, the soil test report comes back, then you can adjust the soils necessary. Uh, you can apply lime to adjust pH, or you can use dolomitic lime if magnesium is deficient, which is in many Missouri soils. You can add micronutrients if needed, as indicated by the soil test. And, and uh, if you had foliar tests in previous years that indicated a need for micronutrients, these can be applied at this point as well. Now, what about nitrogen? Um, so tomatoes are heavy feeders and they require adequate nitrogen to produce a crop. You know, again, particularly with indeterminate cultivars, there's a lot of plant mass and, and fruit mass in a tomato crop, and it's necessary to have sufficient nitrogen. So pre-plant nitrogen, um, the soil test report will come back with, with a seasonal nitrogen recommendation, and it's based upon your crop, whether it's a determinate or an indeterminate crop, the soil type, and how much organic matter is present in the soil. And you'll look at that amount and then you apply a third to a half of that before you plant the tomatoes. And this is usually incorporated into the, uh, the uh, tomato bed. And if you're using uh, uh, conventional fertilizers, consider a non-ammoniacal form such as calcium nitrate to provide again a third to half of the total seasonal needs of, of the tomato crop. Now, if you're an organic farmer, uh, there are options as well. Composted manure is generally the best source of nutrients for organic production. And this could be dairy manure or poultry manure. If you're using dairy manure, about 2,700 pounds of compost per thousand square feet. So again, a fairly heavy application. Again, uh, organic sources of nitrogen are typically much lower in analysis than conventional sources. So the actual quantities for application are higher. Again, with composted poultry manure, this will be somewhere around 900 pounds of compost per thousand square feet. And again, you're, this is based upon the uh, needs of the crop of about 100 pounds of available nitrogen per acre. Now we have to remember that not all of the nitrogen in organic sources is immediately available. It's released over time. And again, uh, we also have to realize that not all of the nitrogen that is in organic sources is actually available over the course of that production cycle. So about 30% in poultry compost, 14% in dairy compost. These are the assumptions we're making in coming up with these rates uh, of dairy and poultry manure. Patrick, we have a question, uh, yes. a couple of questions actually. So the first one says, have you considered, this is from the past section, have you considered planting annual flowers such as zinnias or marigolds to increase pollination? Uh, you could certainly plant companion crops along with the tomatoes, but again, recognize that, that with tomatoes, it's not so much a question of, of uh, well, it, it's more a question of having the right types of pollinators present. As I mentioned, bumblebees are very effective. They work well in the high tunnel environment. Honeybees do not. So bumblebees would be the, uh, the uh, bee of choice. And unfortunately, in many cases, uh, native bumblebee populations are in short supply. That's why farmers will typically bring in colonies of uh, bumblebees for pollination purposes. Now, native pollinators can be helpful in pollinating tomatoes, but again, oftentimes they're not present in large enough numbers. And even if we plant a companion crop such as zinnias, uh, we, we just don't have enough pollinators available to, to meet the needs of this crop. You know, the tomatoes produce many, many blossoms, and the blossoms all have to be pollinated. So it requires a, a large workforce of pollinating insects. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of pollinator habitat and companion crops that, that bring in pollinators, but with tomatoes, we just need more than we can, we can typically expect from our, our native or our naturally occurring pollinators. Okay, and then another question asks, is there a nitrogen percentage for horse manure? Uh, horse manure, well, uh, keep in mind that, that 
all of these manure sources will vary to some degree. And it's based upon whether it's, it's fresh weight or dried weight, whether there is any bedding incorporated along with the manure, how the manure has been handled, all these things can, can affect the uh, content. Horse manure would actually have a content closer to the uh, manure of, or the uh, content of uh, dairy manure. And it's definitely lower than the content of uh, poultry manure. Okay, and then another question, what about the use of leaves as a cover crop to increase soil nutrients, especially organic content? Uh, the use of leaves can be very helpful, uh, particularly if they're used in between rotations of a crop like tomatoes. Um, in, in, in my experience, leaves become particularly helpful when they're incorporated into a composting process. And then the resulting compost is, is very valuable for, for, uh, for crops. Now, leaves in their, you know, in the form as they drop from the trees, they have to decompose before the nutrients and the organic matter within those leaves is useful for the tomato crop. And so, again, in my experience, it's, it's a better practice to take these leaves and incorporate them into a composting process and then use the compost as the amendment with the tomato crop. Now, in a home garden, there's no reason you couldn't use leaves as a mulch around tomato plants. They work quite well for that. But on a larger scale application, it would be better to compost those leaves first and then use the resulting compost as the amendment. Okay. And those are all the questions we have right now. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, let's turn our attention to uh, uh, potassium and phosphorus now. And again, tomatoes are, are heavy users of uh, these nutrients as well. And the soil test report will give us information on how much might be needed to, to supplement what is naturally occurring in the soil. And uh, with that recommendation, we put about a third to a half of what's recommended pre-plant and potassium nitrate as far as a conventional fertilizer is a reasonable source of uh, potassium. Phosphorus, again, the soil test report will have information on what we need for phosphorus in addition to that that's native in the soil. And superphosphate is a, a good amount and we put the full amount down pre-plant, you know, the full amount that we need. Okay, now once uh, we're, we're at the point of planting the crop, then consider using a starter solution. This is a liquid solution of a fertilizer that is applied at the same time we plant the tomato plants. And the best starter solutions have an NP ratio of about one to three, that's nitrogen to phosphorus and no potassium. Uh, a typical starter solution would be something like three pounds of 10340 and 50 gallons of water. And we give a half pint per plant at transplanting. We can also use uh, uh, various types of manure teas or compost teas to, to perform this same service in an organic production system. Now, fertigation, you know, what about the remaining part of nitrogen and potassium? How do we get that to the plants? Well, typically we do it through what's called fertigation. And uh, I'm gonna fire up this video here. So we'll have a little bit of sound effect behind me as I talk about this. But fertigation is injecting fertilizers into the irrigation system. Now, again, it's based upon the soil test recommendation. And we start this about two weeks after transplanting. And we're going to apply about eight to 10 pounds of nitrogen per acre per week. And we can use the system such as we see here. This is the dosatron system that is an active injection system. Uh, below the dosatron, we see the reservoir where we mix up the fertilizer solution and then it is metered out by the dosatron into the irrigation system. And, and yes, I know this is not tomatoes, this is blackberries, but it's the same approach with the tomato crop in a high tunnel. So again, we can very carefully control the rate at which we apply nutrients, and we can do it at a, a uh, set intervals with this type of an approach. A recommended forms of nitrogen to inject into an irrigation system are calcium nitrate and potassium nitrate. Now, uh, using this approach, and, and in general with, fer with uh, fertility management, it's very important to monitor nitrogen and potassium fertility, okay? Yes, we have a plan in place, but is it really meeting the needs of the crop? And the way that we understand that is by doing a foliar analysis. And we'll see a video on that here in just a moment. But a foliar analysis will actually tell us the nutrients that are in the uh, tomato plant. And once we know that bit of information, we can adjust fertigation is needed. We can apply more or less based upon what we've learned from the foliar test. 
We also can apply magnesium as Epsom salts, as indicated by the foliar analysis. Magnesium deficiency is very common in high tunnels, uh, high tunnel tomato crops here in Missouri. And we can also apply micronutrients if they're uh, indicated in short supply by the foliar analysis. Okay, let's watch a quick video here to uh, learn more about how to collect a tomato foliar sample. Okay, Anna, can we see the uh, video? We can see it, we can see it. Okay, very good. I'm Patrick, I'm Patrick Byers, Byers, horticulture field specialist with University of Missouri Extension. Fertility management is an important part of success with tomatoes, especially when the crop is grown in a protective structure such as a high tunnel. Certainly information on the uh, soil test and, and the information on rates are helpful, but a very important tool that farmers can use to assess the success of a fertility management program is foliar testing. Foliar testing is a great way to keep a handle on nutritional management in tomatoes. By testing the foliage at various stages during the growth cycle, you can get a feel for the nutrient levels that are within the plant. You can identify trends, and you can also find problems before they become problems and address them before they impact productivity. Foliar testing is also a useful way to diagnose problems, and particularly when leaves are exhibiting symptoms that may be the result of a nutritional problem, by collecting a sample of healthy leaves and a sample of leaves exhibiting symptoms and comparing the results, this can be a very useful way to identify nutritional issues. There are several growth stages where foliar testing is particularly helpful. As the tomato plant moves from vegetative growth into fruiting growth, this is a good time to get a feel for the nutritional status of the plants. As the first blossoms open, this is a good time to collect foliar samples. Another important time to sample is as the first fruit set begins to enlarge. A third point at which to sample is as the first fruit set begins to ripen. As the crop then commences, it's useful to sample about every two weeks during the remainder of the productive cycle of that tomato planting. When collecting a tomato foliar sample, the goal is to collect leaves that are fully expanded and typically those are the third or fourth leaves down from the growing point. Leaf number one, number two, number three, and number four. And remember when you collect the leaf, it's the entire leaf, it's not these individual leaflets. So when you collect the leaf, this is what the sample will look like. A tomato foliar sample consists of around 20 leaves. Make sure that that sample represents the entire planting so in other words, you want to collect up and down all of the rows in the high tunnel and make sure that you collect the sample from different cultivars separately. You want to sample cultivars individually. The first step is to label the collection bag. And so this is from the Iker farm. The uh, cultivar is Red Deuce. This is a routine sample. And we are collecting on April 21st, 2021. So 4, 21, 21. Remember that the tomato foliar sample should represent the entire high tunnel. So let's go ahead and collect the sample. Once the foliar sample is collected, the goal is to get it to the analytical laboratory as soon as possible. Hold the sample under refrigeration and then either deliver it or ship it to the lab 
so that it's in the hands of a lab technicians as soon as possible after collection. Now let's take a look at the laboratory report on the tomato foliar sample that was collected earlier in the video. A typical lab report will include several things. The first column lists the elements that were evaluated during the, uh, the uh, laboratory test on the tissue sample. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, iron, manganese, copper, and zinc. The second column is the actual content of the foliar sample for the, the uh, individual nutrients. In the case of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, and magnesium, this is a percent dry weight of the tissue sample. In the case of iron, manganese, copper, and zinc, this is a parts per million level in the uh, foliar sample. The third column lists what's called the sufficiency range. And the sufficiency range is the range of nutrient content that is considered to be normal to, to, to what would be found in a healthy tissue sample. And sufficiency ranges are arrived at as the result of exhaustive research and also grower experiences across a wide range of growing environments. In other words, a tissue sample from a healthy tomato plant would have nutrients that fall within the sufficiency range. And the final three columns are a graphic illustration comparing the uh, actual content in the foliar sample with the sufficiency range. So let's take a look at what this particular test report is telling us. First of all, nitrogen, 2.36% is definitely below the sufficiency range. And in fact, it's considered to be very low. The other nutrients all fall within the optimum or high levels, and, and this is encouraging. But if we take a look at potassium at 2.99, this is actually on the low end of the optimum range. And this too would be cause for concern because again, one of the benefits of a foliar test is to help us identify trends over time. If this was the first sample of the season, then, then the grower would want to carefully watch the level of uh, potassium moving ahead. Now, how can we uh, uh, use the results of a foliar test in guiding fertility management? Well, in this case, the farmer was using a combination of uh, potassium nitrate and a balanced uh, complete tomato fertilizer to meet uh, fertility needs. And these materials were both injected into the irrigation stream. So the recommendation was, first of all, to increase the rate of potassium nitrate. This would address both the uh, shortage of nitrogen and also what may be uh, an upcoming shortage of potassium. The uh, uh, tomato fertilizer, the, the complete tomato fertilizer also included micronutrients and the recommendation was to increase that rate as well to again hopefully address issues that might be uh, pending or impending in the case of, of iron, manganese, and zinc. For more information on using tomato foliar testing to help evaluate a tomato fertility program, reach out to your local county extension office or reach out directly to the University of Missouri Extension field horticulturist that is assigned to your county. This map shows the territories of the uh, horticulture field specialists across Missouri. Find your county and identify the specialist. If your county has an open horticulture position, then reach out to the closest specialist. I'm sure they'll be happy to help. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, return to the presentation. Okay, we have one question. Yes. It says, how do you convert amount per acre to tunnel size? We were talking about that before the video. So the, the important thing to, to remember is the relationship of uh, an acre to square feet. And an acre is 43,560 square feet. And then you can relate that to the uh, square footage of the tunnel to come up with a conversion from a per acre rate to a rate that fits the, uh, the uh, area within the tunnel, or, or for that matter, any area. So again, remember that conversion of, a, of an acre being 43,560 square feet. Okay, that's the only question right now. Okay. So again, just to briefly review foliar testing, it's the only way to know if your fertilizer program is really working. 
And again, the good times to collect those samples, the first open flower, developing fruit, the first ripe fruit, and then every two weeks following. Uh, we covered all of this in the video already, but again, 20 to 25 leaves and make sure that the leaves are, are all of the same age. So typically it's the fourth fully expanded leaf from the top. And we saw uh, the results of a soil test in the video. Here would be another example of uh, soil test results for my, for my high tunnel tomato crop. Again, the important thing to note is to compare the uh, actual content of the foliar sample with the sufficiency ranges. And if we look at this particular report, again, just looking at nitrogen, we'll notice that the uh, sample is 3.77%. And the optimum range here is, or the target range is about 4.4%. So obviously uh, nitrogen is in a lower than optimum situation with this particular crop of tomatoes. Okay, let's go through some disease and insect issues that, that are found in high tunnels in Missouri. And among diseases, the uh, sort of the big four are Botrytis, Cladosporium leaf mold, bacterial canker, and timber rot. Yes, you can see other diseases in, in high tunnel tomato crops, but these would be the four that are most commonly found. And among the arthropods, two-spotted spider mites and thrips. We also find pests such as a tomato fruitworm, as you see in the lower picture there, and also uh, tomato hornworm. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail on uh, pesticides, et cetera. There's good resources available, such as the uh, uh, Midwest Vegetable Production Guide that talk about management strategies that incorporate pesticides, and I, I would recommend that uh, uh, farmers consult that for more information, but we'll just briefly look at these, these pest problems. So here's Botrytis. It's most noticeable as a wedge-shaped uh, brownish area on the foliage. And again, if you look at the uh, picture on the right, closely at those leaves, you can see how the tips are involved and there's sort of a wedge-shaped discolored area on the foliage. It can also attack the developing tomatoes. That lower picture shows a, a small tomato fruit that has been infected by Botrytis near the, uh, the stem end. Cladosporium leaf mold, uh, these yellowish areas on the top of the leaf are very diagnostic for cladosporium. And if we flip those over on the underside, we see uh, 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 spots that correspond to the yellow spots on top, but they're kind of a, a grayish brown color on the underside of the leaf. Bacterial canker, uh, initially it causes burning along the edges of the leaves. If we slice a, a branch open, we notice the discoloration in the center of the stem and eventually the plant collapses and dies. Timber rot, usually timber rot is associated with a wound. And in this case, we can see the clip that was holding the uh, tomato plant, uh, stem up actually uh, abraded a uh, leaf there. You can see how it broke the leaf and uh, that opened up a wound and the uh, timber rot organism then moved into the stem and caused this, this diseased or cankered area. And eventually the plant will die from that point out. Now, we occasionally see blossom end rot in high tunnels. And this is a calcium deficiency that causes the tissues at the uh, blossom end of the tomato fruit to, to rot and the fruit is lost. This is not a disease. It's caused again by a nutritional imbalance but uh, it is a problem that we see frequently with the very earliest tomatoes on the plant. Now, uh, integrated pest management strategies for, uh, for these problems. Uh, first of all, plant resistant cultivars. And you might consider grafting, particularly if you have soil borne diseases in the tunnel. Make sure that you space the plants properly and you have the rows far enough apart to allow for good air movement. Pruning and leaf removal. You know, we talked about that earlier and I, I mentioned that uh, uh, you know, we do this for several reasons, but the primary reason we do that is to open up the structure under the plants to allow for good movement of air under the canopy of the tomato plants. Humidity management is critical when it comes to disease management in the high tunnel. Humid environment favors diseases. So it's very important to vent tunnels and to move humid air out of tunnels as effectively as possible. And again, I mentioned the, the uh, benefits of uh, active ventilation, fans, within the tunnel or perhaps even fans on the end walls to move this humid air out of the tunnel. So again, you're moving this air not only to remove heat, but also to remove humidity. Consider using anti-condensate plastic film when you cover the tunnel. 
this actually reduces dripping. And dripping, of course, lands on the plants and keeps them wet and encourages diseases. Sanitation, we talked about that already, and I'll mention it again. And then pesticide applications, both organic pesticides and conventional pesticides, if used properly, can be very effective in managing diseases and insects within the high tongue. Okay, well, to conclude our presentation, we'll just talk briefly about harvest and uh, expected yields. And with high tunnel tomatoes, you have a lot of flexibility in harvest time. In the open field, frequently, uh, tomatoes have to be harvested at the breaker stage. Otherwise, you run into issues with fruit rots or other problems if you allow the fruit to remain on the vine until vine ripe. But in the high tunnel environment, you can allow the fruit to stay on the plant longer. But even, even saying that, the majority of tomatoes grown in a high tunnel are going to be harvested at breaker stage. And if we look at this picture of tomatoes, the, uh, the uh, second tomato down from the top, the one that's just starting to turn color, that's breaker stage. And at this stage, they're still firm, they can be easily handled. And then if placed in the right environment, they will go ahead and ripen and develop nearly full flavor and certainly full color. Now a vine ripe tomato, the tomato at the top is fully colored and this would be harvested at the vine ripe stage. These tomatoes are softer, they're more of a challenge to handle, but if handled carefully, they will give, uh, 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 you know, they, they can be can moved easily and quickly to, to markets for sale. Um, typically, as I mentioned, uh, the majority of the crop will be harvested to breaker stage and then it's ripened in a special ripening room. And the optimum temperature for ripening tomatoes is somewhere between 55 and 65. And if you want to hold tomatoes, they can be held at the breaker stage at 50 to 55 degrees for, for some period of time. But typically, once you've harvested the tomato, you don't want to delay too long in ripening it and then marketing it. And then just a quick note on yields. Again, indeterminate tomatoes, which again are strong, vigorous growing plants. They give a much longer harvest season. 20 to 30 pounds of tomatoes per plant would be an expected yield. Determinate plants, again, 10 to 20 pounds of, of fruit per, per plant. It's a shorter season, it's a shorter plant. So that is a, an overview of high tunnel tomato production. Uh, at this point, Anna, do we have any questions? We don't have any questions right now. Okay, well, I would encourage, I would encourage anyone who is, is in the uh, class, if you want more information on uh, tunnel production, to check out our Missouri Tomato School uh, videos. These are all uh, videos that are available through the Web City Farmers Market website. And if you'd like to reach out to me at this phone number or uh, this uh, email address, email is the better way, um, I can steer you towards that website. But we have a wealth of uh, recorded presentations on all aspects of tomato production. In the past, we've held a two-day tomato school here in Missouri where uh, we've had uh, uh, tomato specialists from across the country come in and address all aspects of tomato production. And then we've toured tomato farms. And we've, we've uh, captured and recorded as much of those uh, events as possible and have them available for viewing. So if you'd like more information on that, please reach out. And then I'll mention, uh, as far as resources, the uh, Midwest Vegetable Production Guide, a very helpful resource for tomato farmers. And then there are two tomato resources that I'll mention. One is the uh, the uh, Tomato Compendium of Diseases, a very helpful overview of tomato uh, diseases and uh, information on how to manage those diseases. And the other is the Greenhouse Tomato Manual, which is a publication available from Mississippi State University that I found to be very useful. Again, for information on both of those publications, please reach out. Okay, Anna, at this point, I think we are at the end of the prepared materials. Let me uh, go ahead and stop share here. And uh, again, if we have any questions at this point, uh, we, we can spend a few minutes uh, discussing tomatoes in more detail. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the, uh, into the uh, uh, Q&A or, you know, we're a small enough group that if you'd like to unmute and, and uh, uh, just ask a question, that would be perfectly all right as well. Okay, yeah, uh, right. participants can definitely use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We're in a webinar, so we won't be able to unmute ourselves to- Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. So yes, please please type any questions you might have into the Q&A. And just while we're waiting um, for any, any final questions that we have tonight, 
Uh, just to reiterate, after we finish the webinar and we close out of the workshop, uh, a link will pop up to a post-workshop survey. Uh, this survey is used in SCG's uh, evaluations and evaluations with the USDA, and it also helps us provide uh, meaningful workshops to all of you in the future. Um, so I appreciate it if we could take a few minutes at the end uh, to fill that out. We'd, we'd appreciate that a lot. It looks like we have one question. Can you review types of indeterminate tomatoes? Sure. So indeterminate tomatoes come in, in basically all types. But for example, um, most uh, heirlooms, most cherry or you know, small fruited tomatoes, and most beefsteak tomatoes are indeterminate types. We have slicing type tomatoes that are indeterminate as well. So you have a wide choice of cultivars to choose from if you're looking for an indeterminate type tomato. Okay, the next question says, what are some particularly good rotational crops with tomatoes in the tunnel environment? Well, good rotational crops would be those crops that can grow during the cooler part of the season. You know, the tomato crop is typically occupying the tunnel from spring through summer. So if we look towards things such as uh, shorter term warm season crops following a determinate tomato crop, you know, we might have time to put in a crop of, uh, of uh, uh, flowers, for example, or for, for cut flowers, or perhaps a crop of a short season warm vegetable. But as we move into the fall and winter, we can, we can put in cool season crops, such as cold crops, root vegetables, or um, leafy greens and spinach following a tomato crop. And that can give us a good crop to, to include in the tunnel through the cooler part of the year. Now it does present some challenges if our goal is to start a very early crop of tomatoes, because frequently we, we will still have those cool season crops in place during that late February planting uh, period for the tomatoes. But if we can hold off and wait to plant that tomato crop until in March, then we should have time to, to harvest the cool season crop that's in place in the tunnel. We can also set up these rotations in such a way that we can interplant the tomatoes among the cool season vegetables while they're still in place. You know, for example, if we're doing a bed system, we can have a row of, of lettuce or spinach along the edges of the bed, and that allows us space to plant the tomato crop in the middle of the bed. And so the tomato crop can start to grow while we're still harvesting the cool season vegetables. Okay, the next question says, do you have any advice for heirloom production? Oh gosh, um, so yeah, heirlooms can be a challenge if, if the goal is to make money from the planting because they tend to be shy producers, they tend to be soft and difficult to handle, and they tend to be disease prone and crack prone. Now, growing heirlooms in a tunnel helps overcome some of those challenges and grafting heirlooms onto to a vigorous rootstocks can help with productivity. So in my experience, if your goal is to make money from an heirloom crop, I would consider planting grafted tomatoes and I would definitely grow them in the high tunnel. Now, a recent development are hybrid tomatoes that look like heirloom tomatoes. And uh, these have some of the benefits of hybrid tomatoes, but they still have the unique flavors, unique uh, fruit colors and unique fruit shapes of heirloom tomatoes. So a, a farmer might consider those uh, from the standpoint of, of uh, profitability in the tomato planting. In the home garden, ooh, tomato, heirloom tomatoes are a challenge, quite frankly. And I've seen uh, serious home tomato growers put in a high tunnel strictly because they want to grow heirloom tomatoes. So again, heirlooms do much better in the high tunnel environment. All right, we have a participant who has a three season tunnel with the center peeling, would you expect that to be able to hold up any indeterminate tomatoes or do you suggest determinate tomatoes? I would suggest determinate tomatoes in any three season tunnel. Even with, with uh, I mean, three season tunnels by definition have a lighter framework and uh, they're not intended to hold up a lot of weight on top of the tunnel. And similarly, they're not intended to hold a lot of weight hanging from the tunnel. So my advice would be a determinate crop of tomatoes in the three season tunnel. Is there a way to grow cherry tomatoes indoors through the winter using full spectrum lighting and controlling the temperature? Uh, yes, it is theoretically possible to grow an indoor crop of tomatoes you know, within the home. But again, which the, the conditions you have to supply are would be the equivalent of outdoor full sun and uh, you don't want temperatures that are, that are too cool or too warm. Again, we're recognizing the, the optimum temperatures for the tomatoes. And uh, 
you have to be able to control humidity. And, and oftentimes in certain parts of the house, that can be a challenge. Um, the other issue, of course, is that most cherry tomatoes are indeterminate tomatoes and they will grow and grow and grow and they become pretty lanky by the time you're two to three months into production inside. So they can, they can be a challenge, it can be done. And I've personally done it myself, but uh, recognize that there, there can be some challenges. Do you have a good resource for soil amendments that, be, that can be purchased in bulk? Hmm. Well, you know, any of the, the uh, uh, production guides for organic tomato production will have advice on the best amendments. Now, as far as where to purchase them in bulk, um, you know, I, because of my, my, my position as an extension specialist, I'm not encouraged to recommend specific sources. But I, I will say there are a number of recognized sources for, for bulk organic amendments. And, uh, you know, if you reach out to any organic farmer, they can give you advice on where to source larger quantities of organic amendments. And one thing I'll mention to put a plug in for, for programming, um, Springfield Community Gardens hosts an annual, uh, not an annual, a monthly farm walk. And we meet at, at Millsap Farm. It's uh, on the, during the winter time, it's on the third Saturday of the month at one o'clock. And we spend time with, with the uh, farmer there. And uh, Millsap Farm is, while it's not certified organic, they use organic production practices. And so I have found that that farmer to be a very helpful source of information, such as the question that you've just asked. You may have talked about this a little bit in the last heirloom question, but could you share any experience with heirloom marriage tomatoes? Heirloom marriage tomatoes. I'm afraid that's one I have not grown. Um, you know, again, there's so many interesting and different heirloom tomatoes. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the remarks I made kind of address heirlooms as a group. But as far as that particular one, I, I don't have experience with it. Okay. And is it important to clean out to make tomato plants as soon as the harvest is finished, or can they stay in the bed as they die? Well, you know, if the plants are diseased, as soon as harvest is done, I would get them out, definitely. If they're harboring insects that might move to other parts of the tunnel or other parts of the garden or farm, I would get them out as well. In general, once the crop is, is done, then unless there's a compelling reason not to remove it, I would remove it. Okay, those are all the questions we have right now. Oh, very good. Well, as I mentioned, there are excellent resources available for MU Extension uh, through my office. Please reach out if you'd like more information on, on tomato production. And I'll mention that we'll have a, a number of workshops moving ahead uh, through this partnership with Springfield Community Gardens, USDA, and University of Missouri Extension. Check out the, uh, the uh, Springfield Community Gardens uh, Facebook site for information on when these classes are scheduled. Look forward to seeing you at future classes. Yes, thank you for everyone for being here tonight. And thank you, Patrick, for uh, sharing your time and your expertise with us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. All right, have a good night. Good night, everyone.